Let's have a look at Tuesday's breakfast menu. This is uh, we're going to talk about these four stories for about two minutes each. We'll finish with the tier GA championship structures. Talk about uh, potential golden era in Irish horse racing and how it came about. The Belfast trial fallout. But we're going to start with uh, is Manchester City's money dirtier than Manchester United's? This was inspired yesterday by um, a morally superior Manchester United fan who was like, "Well, you know, it's okay for City with all that." Um, all that oil money, but actually, it's not really that different. There's, there it is. There, it's success in inverted commas, bought and paid for by an Arab benefactor's money. Nothing for any club to be proud of. Liverpool, Spurs, Arsenal, and United all earn the money they spend, whereas the likes of City, PSG, and Chelsea needed sugar daddies to buy trophies. If there is anything more revealing about how Manchester United fans are struggling to cope with the fall of Manchester United, it's when the, when you're left grasping for that kind of argument to deflect from a season which once again has fallen away another manager who's looks like it's not quite going to work out at this stage you couldn't have any confidence that Mourinho is going to win it the money stuff I thought there was I thought Man United fans hated the Glaziers mm. and they thought that the Glaziers had loaded their club with debt and where did Glaziers get their money from if you want to go down that road yeah um, hedge funds Basically, it was like it was all it was financial instruments that allowed them to raise massive amounts of money and forced them to corporatize every single second of the match day experience at Old Trafford, including uh, price hikes um, at various stages during their era. Um, the the whole thing about Man United and the magic of the Ferguson era was that the team went out and tried, and whenever there was an opportunity to attack, they attacked. Like, I mean, there were definitely times when they would grind out results, but like, there was a sense that they were all part of an overarching narrative. The current team, it's like, what is the identity of the, of the group? What is the identity of the style of play? How do you pin yourself to watching that team? And I think that's why the atmosphere is eerie at Old Trafford, as opposed to at Anfield, where the atmosphere is like, every time we get the ball, one of our fast guys is going to get it and we're going to go straight at the opposition and they're going to pass to each other really cleverly and we're probably going to score a goal. I, I think it comes down to stuff happens. Like, if you want a game where stuff happens and with Man United and the way they're going now, it's, it's pedestrian, it's predictable, it's slow and whereas with Liverpool, and this pains me to say this, but with Liverpool, they just go with aggression, they go with style and it's... it's there is a bit of a nostalgia thing here, though. There's this image that all Ferguson's teams for 20-whatever number of years were all fluid, all attacking, never sat back, never played defensive. And United, when they went away in Europe, for example, often played under Ferguson, as he, in, in, the, in the 2000s in particular, yeah. kind of sat in, grind, grind five on midfield. results, five-man midfield, yeah. all of that. And United had some very poor players under Alex Ferguson, but he always had enough players in, to go for it and he always seemed to want to go for it and to play with attacking footballer and he, did, he didn't ever seem afraid to take a chance with players. I think as well he had credit in the bank from the, the team of the late 90s. There was a, a brilliant piece, um, Daniel Harris was tweeting links from his book where he was saying in advance of the um, FA Cup replay against Arsenal, the one where Ryan Giggs scores the goal, before that game he gave two pieces of advice to um, Beckham and to Giggs. The Beckham advice was stop being, stop trying stuff. You're a brilliant striker of the ball, pass it and kick it. Stop trying anything else. And with Giggs it was stop just passing it, try stuff. You, you are one of the most elaborately gifted footballers in the history of the world. Every time you get it, you try and do stuff. And uh, lo and behold, Beckham whips in an amazing cross and Giggs goes off and scores that slalom run. Like, but at least there was that sense that that team, anything could happen and they were always trying to do stuff. This team, it's like, what the hell? Are yes, uh, Ferguson did a couple of interesting things. Though. Like, it's kind of forgotten about now, in, and it was particularly forgotten about when, when Paul Scholes retired. Ferguson dropped Paul Scholes for a while in the middle of it. Like this extravagantly gifted player, the best English midfielder of his generation, blah, 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 Yeah. Uh, as, as some people say. And it's all forgotten that Ferguson left him out for, for essentially for a season when he bought Veron. Yeah. And tried to shoot one Veron into the team and played them all together, and it was terrible for you. And sco didn't scold, didn't scold the client to get off the bus. Yeah. At, uh, out yeah. at an Anfield once in. Because he was a sub. Because he was, yeah, he was. Uh, uh, and yeah. he. he so, so there's a way of casting back through history, and Ferguson's insulated because of the trophies he won, and you can't gainsay what it's achieved, and no one wins every year. And they recovered as well, I think. The, the relationship with Skulls did recover 
with Ferguson. Whereas if that was to happen with Mourinho, I can't imagine that would that relationship would recover as well. Like, I I definitely think Ferguson was a bully, and uh, there were loads of like scratchy one 0 wins against Southampton where the goal comes from a dodgy penalty decision that, that are completely airbrushed from history because Ryan Giggs does that goal and everybody remembers that. But it's funny with managers, though, isn't it? There's there's an alchemy involved in looking at a manager in a place, and they either look right and sometimes they don't. Ferguson, the Ferguson Man United fit, uh, and I don't look at Man United as some sort of dream machine or I don't have a nostalgic kind of view of, of that but the fit doesn't look right for all for the image that the club portrays itself no it doesn't feel right and it didn't it it you you, you saw looking at David Moyes uh, David Moyes looked haunted within a couple of months of, <laughs> yeah, of straight away straight away he yeah. just it just kind of thought this isn't going to work and it's not clear who who you would if you shipped out Jose Mourinho who would you actually put in there well like they should have gone for somebody like Jurgen Klopp. They should have gone for somebody like Guardiola, where you could have had like, oh, we're at the bleeding edge of world football. Um, when David Moyes was approached by Ferguson, he says, the blood drained from my face, yeah. and it never came back. <laughs> he calls him Sir Alex. Yeah, like, come on, you know? Like, yeah, all right. Our second talking point this morning, if we could uh, stick it back up, is the Belfast trial fallout. So this is uh, this morning, uh, late yesterday, uh, Claremont de Verne, very quick off the mark to say that they weren't in the uh, Paddy Jackson sweepstakes and that they had no interest in bringing him to their club. Um, it did strike me yesterday that if you were a club in world rugby, why would you be rushing off the mark to sign either of these two players now, given what's just happened? If you were a club, and purely looking at this from the business perspective for a moment, there's no rush for to sign these players. You wait until August when they have no bargaining power and you've established that nobody else really wants to bring the toxic element to their brand and uh, you sign them on the cheap. That's how world sports business works. Except it seems to me that rugby rosters seem to fill earlier in the season that it's not like the summer transfer market in, in soccer seems to be. I'm not saying people don't move at that stage. Yeah. Broadly speaking, but I think your point stands. Um, I think uh, you. I think there's a huge risk for a club to sign either of these players at the moment, and I, it's not obvious what the reward is for signing beyond getting two outstanding players. But everything that comes around it and everything that has this trial touches is now toxic. It doesn't feel like it's over. It's, it's everything it seeps into. It, it has damaged so many people and it, it, it doesn't feel like it's gone away yet. It, it also feels like um, everybody along the way has been really badly advised, maybe with the exception of the IRFU, who I think have handled this about as well as it's possible to do under the circumstances. And like we've been very critical of the IRFU for a bunch of the decisions that they've made over the last couple of years, but um, by acting the way they have, in the manner they have, it seems like they've understood the desire of most people in the rugby fraternity and beyond to say we don't want to be associated with this. Um, but certainly the players, the, you know, you think back to the, the statements outside the courthouse, Stuart Oling found some kind of, his solicitor found some, some semblance of empathy for um, the complainant in the case. Paddy Jackson, it was nine days later before he apologised for his actions and immediately suggesting that all these clubs are really interested in these players. And then the clubs start coming out and going, no, 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 no. Whoever's doing that on the behalf of the players, just calm down and disappear. Go off for a while. Like, go away for a while. I, I agree with you on the IRFU, except I think there is an outstanding question that remains to be asked there, and it's around Rory Best. And it's, did they know that Rory Best was going to attend the trial on the, on the Wednesday? Of, on his day off in that week before the France game, and what did they think about his attendance of that trial? I think there are two basic questions that the IRFU still still must answer. I'll actually really be interested in Joe Schmidt's answer to to those questions as well. I think there's jo, Joe Schmidt is 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 a man who doesn't shy from saying stuff, even at difficult times. For example, uh, this is a totally different thing to the rape trial, obviously, uh, but. When there was that incident between Paul O'Connell and Dave Carney, he had no problem speaking out about Paul O'Connell, despite the fact that Joe Schmidt was just about to take the Ireland job, and it, that created difficulties here. So he's a man who has been willing in the past to make public statements. It would be really interesting to know, did he know that Rory Best was going to go to the trial, and what did he think of it? Yeah. And um, what does he think of it? Even, and so even if they didn't know, 
right? There's still the question of should the Ireland rugby captain appear even in a private capacity, because it's not a private capacity. We know, like, when... Um, I think it might have been Brendan Fanning talking at the weekend, is that, like, you're always on. You're, you're always on as part of your job now. You're always on. So, um, And then there's also the, the impact that, that we now know that um, the jury were told that he was directed to appear um, by the defence counsel, but they can't really direct. Like, that's... Uh, but direct was a really interesting choice of words. And it's, it's made up. Like, it's a made-up thing, you know. And the way it was explained, it would be very interesting to, to, to know exactly what happened here. And it, it is the question for Rory Best. Why exactly were you there? And I, I was thinking about this. It's a very difficult thing on one level. If it was somebody in a dressing room for a team that I would have played for, or if for someone, you know, would you go in, in a private capacity to, 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 to lend support to that person? But it actually doesn't apply to an individual it apply, it's a different thing if you're an international rugby player and you're a captain of an international rugby team. And I think it would be very interesting to imagine a scenario where that was the captain of the Irish soccer team who had gone to such a trial. What would the outcry have been against that person? I think Rory Best, by the way, was entirely taken aback by the reaction. The way he declined questions on the Friday for the captain's run, the way he spoke on the Saturday. And interestingly, what... He, uh, there was, seems to have been a s suggestion from Brendan Kelly, Paddy Jackson's lawyer, that there was a reluctance among certain people who said they were going to give character references at the beginning to give them afterwards. Now, who were those people and what exactly brought about their reluctance? Yeah, I, I, look, I, I, I do think that um, they're going to have to come out and address this because, uh, like... <laughs> Rugby is one of those sports that talks about its values a lot, right? To the point where it nauseates a lot of people. And either you talk about it and they mean something or it's just can't. And if it's just made up marketing bullshit, then fair enough, but you're going to get called on it for the rest of your lives. But if, if your values mean something, then being the captain is supposed to mean that you're, you are the public representative at all times while you are that Ireland rugby captain, England rugby captain, whatever, while you are that captain. And this is kind of an honorarium then down through the years. Like, you know, you're part of a long line of these people who uh, are supposed to represent the best of that rugby culture. So you therefore, when you show up, represent that rugby culture and you can't divorce yourself from that if you want to continue in the role, unless you want to not continue in the role, and that's fair enough. Like, that's also fair enough. I, I think that's it, and it's, it's, it is this question um, around the very fact of attendance of himself and Ian Henderson and Craig Gilroy all on the same day, in the week where that complainant spoke about um, you know, going up against the culture of Ulster, of, of Ulster rugby. Now, it's very interesting... Um, when you think about it, was it, you can't describe what happened on that night as a rugby culture. It's deeply unfair to, for anybody to say that it's, it was a rugby culture uh, on that evening because it's for two reasons. First of all, there are many rugby people who are utterly appalled by, by what happened and do not deserve in any way to be associated with it, number one. And number two, to describe it as a rugby culture is to imagine or to, to contend that it couldn't happen. In, in another sport, in, which is, of course, a nonsense. It's happened all around the world in yes. other sports, and it's happened in Ireland as well. It's just that... No, it, that and so it's not... So, so to describe it as that is, is, is not enough, but the problem with the attendance of the Irish rugby captain is that it further identifies Irish rugby with that, with the events of that evening and that trial and everything that happened around it. And that's, that's, that's just... Uh, it's very difficult to see how that is not the case. Yeah, so... What happens? Do you think that there's like a natural in the summer that maybe Roy Best doesn't go on the tour or does Roy Best continue as captain and need to just come out and address it? And is there a way that you can address this and still be the Ireland captain? I, like, I, I guess that's the question that we need to, to see answered. But what do you think? Well, it, it, it was very interesting after the England game. Jo, uh, Joe Schmidt played an unbelievably fulsome tribute to Rory Best. And that was, how do you read that? Some people were saying, oh, that means Rory Best is there for the next 18 months and he will lead Ireland into the World Cup. Or was it? I said, listen, I think you're brilliant, but by the way, yeah. this, this is over. And I, 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 think, it's, I think it's a moot point. Um, it would not, I wouldn't, find it in, I wouldn't surpri be surprised at all if there's a new Ireland rugby co captain 
uh, after the summer tour. And uh, like as a direct result of what's happened here, as opposed to because he's because he's not coming to the natural end. It looks like he's he's just had a really good Six Nations, and they're minding him, and he's minding himself because he's obviously at an age now where it's not guaranteed that he's going to make it all the way to the, the Rugby World Cup. And there was a bit of a plateau in form towards the end of last year, but actually a really strong recovery. Played really well in the Six Nations, and looks like he he could easily make it to the World Cup now. Um, with the way things are going. So you think that if he's not the Ireland captain, it is as a direct result of the fallout from this trial? I, I, I don't know enough about rugby, or I don't know enough about how, how what Joe Schmidt plans and what he intends to do to say it, to say that it would be a direct result of that. But I'd say it is a, it is a factor within, within the consideration. It should be said, by the way, that Rory Best comes across as, as a very decent man, a very, a very likeable man, a very down-to-earth man who seems to be liked by a whole lot of of other people, but this trial, yeah. this trial is just everything that it touches. It just, it, there's a, it, there's a noxious element to it, which just, it, it corrodes everything it touches. And I, I think that it actually goes back to the bad advice that everybody was getting, that Ulster were getting, that Ulster were giving. It seems to their players that the players who, that that the players who showed up got bad advice from whoever said you should come to this trial, like, um, or. I think everybody kind of misunderstood exactly the impact that the trial was going to have on everything outside it, on the media, the the fact that there would be so much media coverage, that it would be so intense, and yet it was kind of predictable that it would be such a, an intense thing. I, I think it also comes out, Ger, Ger, I think it's 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 a little bit more than that as well, though it comes down to the culture that was revealed by those WhatsApp and text messages and everything that, notwithstanding the verdict, everything that that revealed about the mores of what were happening in that evening around those rugby players. Yeah, I, the, the WhatsApp certainly did um, exacerbate the level of coverage that they were getting. So, um, yeah, because I just want to play you this. It's, it's Brian O'Driscoll speaking on the show last night, obviously. Um, now, we hadn't addressed the, the trial during the fact that the trial, during the fact, during the time the trial was on with Brian when he was in, because obviously we can't talk about anything, but once the result came out and once the reporting restrictions were lifted, it was actually the first opportunity that we'd had to speak to Brian O'Driscoll. So here are his thoughts on the decision to cancel Jackson and all his contracts from last night's show. I think from the IRFU perspective, um, I think they were probably left with no option but to sever ties with, with Stuart and Paddy. Um, you can probably only speculate really as to whether it's, it's based on moral or, or commercial grounds. I'd imagine probably a bit of both, but there's no doubt, uh, which was well documented in the papers at the weekend, that there was pressure from sponsors. But I think that was probably fueled as well by, um, you know, probably public um, concern and unease about what their potential future might be. So Which I we think saw they went, Friday they went hand in hand. Before the Ospreys game. Yeah, a yeah. number of protests outside the stadium and you wouldn't imagine that was something that was going to just dissipate. That was going to continue. Yeah, it was going to continue. Um, and you know, we got a, a taste of it in, in, in the Kingspan Stadium and had the decision been different, I think you, you probably would have seen um, you know, more of that. And, yeah. um, and I think the IRFU moved swiftly to try and end this situation and, and end the, the slur on the reputation of the game that has been in, you know, in Ireland over the course of the last few months. Right, um, let's move on because there's loads of other stuff that we want to talk about. Um, so, a golden era in Irish horse racing. How did it happen that we go from um, not having winners at Cheltenham ever to the point where it's like a national story, we'd have one winner at Cheltenham and we'd be like, oh, Desert, whatever the horse was that I can't even remember the name of, or a, a national winner. Desert Orc was Irish, right? I don't it? know if the horse knew he was Irish, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, so, like, is this just a direct result of the investments that has been made in Irish racing that you can trace money into outputs? I think it works. I think well, what history tells you about sport, I think, is that that un, 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 unparalleled success and repeated success, which appears from uh, which is different to what has gone before, is a product of, of, of different things. It is investment. The relationship between money and sport and, and input of money in sport is crucial, number one. Number two, there are a couple of key individuals who make decisions and drive standards which change the landscape. That's almost always the case in, in sport. And number three, things are usually cyclical. So what happens now and what has driven now for a while will last for a while and the question is, when that cycle turns, how far will it drop? And usually it doesn't drop quite 
as far as it is, the point where it has where it has come from. So it is a golden age, and we should really enjoy it. Yeah, and I'm, I I think um, the success of otherwise. I mean, it's Cheltenham is and he, Ch- Cheltenham and Entry. It, it's really fascinating that 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 sport that a sport which is based on animals and should be. Um, uh, which, in which is individuals, either jockeys or trainers, should somehow be uh, kind of elevated to an Ireland v England yeah. match. Yeah. Which is very, it's very interesting that, that that should happen. It was a genius of marketing that whoever kind of yeah. started to foster that because ultimately horse people should all be horse people together. It's like it should not be really separated by the construct that is national nationalism. Probably. And of course, then there is the whole siring process and the keeping of books and all of all of that around the place. So it's not, I mean, the nationality of the horses is uh, it's a contested space. Yeah. Okay, so the last point that we were going to talk about here, which I've forgotten, is, oh yeah, the tier GA championship structures. Okay, so... Um, the groundhog day of all. Of in, all. in a kind of off-the-cuff comment, the new GA president comes in and goes, ah, we should have a tier GA championship. And, um, I mean, he's right. It's just whether or not we can actually do it. But 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 is he right? Like, what, what, and what does he mean by a tier GA championship? And I see someone in the paper saying, "Well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't call the lower one a B championship." Well, the players might work it out <laughs> that it's the B championship. <laughs> the supporters of the counties <laughs> might work it out that it's that it's a, that it's a B championship. And is the glory of the championship not that everybody can win it? Now, and if you talk to players from talk to people from Carlow. Or from from my own country, from Offaly. Yeah, they don't want to compete in a in a in a B championship. Now you can say that that well, they they there are too many mismatches. Does that really matter? Because it's these are the dog days of summer. The game is going to the competitive matches happen later on. We already have a tiered competition, which is the league. So which is the best competition, though, right? Um, is it though? It would. That's kind of become accepted as a truism. Is it not the truth, though? There are closer matches between teams. Better matches. The, 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 the attendances now, it's partly to, to do with the time when it's played. The attendances are, are much lower. But what you have in hurling, for example, this year, look at the Munster Championship. The Munster Championship is a league. They've already played the Munster League as the curtain raiser to the season. And the Division One of the league was also with the addition of Limerick, yeah. a Munster Championship yeah. with Kilkenny thrown in. So... Yeah. It's, we're, we're, we have three leagues this year. Yeah, I before think we get to an All Ireland knockout series, there's a there's a strong chance that they've made a, a pig's Mickey out of the hurling this year because they had the opportunity to just break it down and go, you can have the Munster Championship. But they, I think they screwed it up, and we'll see if everybody really cares about all those matches as much, um, and if there's dead rubbers at the end of it. What about right? What about we get rid of the league, and play the league? as the championship, but if you win Division 4, you go into the All-Ireland quarter-final. If you win Division 3, you go into the All-Ireland quarter-final. So you're still, you still have a chance to win. And if you get on a roll, like, say, Tipperary footballers did a couple of years ago, but now you've got a load of home games, a lot of away games against teams of your own standard, and there's, like, promotion and relegation. To me, that makes sense. To me, that's absolutely, absolutely logical. But for that to happen, somebody has to take on the idea of provincial councils and the organisation of a secondary competition well, the tertiary competition, really, when it comes down to it, with the O'Byrne Cup or the Walsh Cup or all of those competitions in, in, in January, Christmas week this year has started. <clears> right? so, so, and then you have to run the provincial council. The provincial championship itself is deeply problematic. Run that for a month in March. And that's, and that's fine, but, but more even than the structures is what is the calendar of play? Like when Are you going to run the two club and county side by side in which players can move between the two? Are you going to organise a structure for that or are you going to pretend that such a thing exists or are you just going to split the seasons? Well,